We got a lot of uh, a lot of cocaine that patrol. I think we ended it with maybe I think it was three or four thousand kilos. Holy shit! Yeah. <laughs> and they would get bored, and they would just start like stacking them with bricks <laughs> and making a, making a throne. Oh my god! And they would sit there on watch on the cocaine. I was in the Coast Guard for four years, from 2019 to beginning of this year, 2023. Spent like three years on a uh, big Coast Guard cutter, which is the fancy name for ships. Didn't really do... I didn't like really rank up very much. I was just a, an E3, E2 and E3 the whole time. So there's like different types. We call like non-rates. So I was a fireman, which does not mean I was a firefighter. I was just an engineer. Yeah, so let's start from the very beginning of how you got in. Yeah, so um, right out of high school, I knew I wasn't going to college because I did pretty pretty poorly in school. And so I had to figure something out to do. And so I chose the Coast Guard of all things because I didn't want to join the other branches. And it just seemed like the best option for me. So I joined back in uh, like January 2019, went to boot camp. And boot camp is weird. It's hard, but it's weird. Yeah, it's just a, it's a very weird place where weird things happen. Like, so when, you know, when you first show up, there's like the typical people screaming at you and, you know, you get off the bus and they're all like screaming at you. Oh, I'll stand in this little spot right here, a little triangle and all that. You have to stand in in formation. Um, then you get like, you know, processed through, they cut your hair and all that fun stuff. On the way to boot camp was actually really funny because we had to like basically go to some army base in Maryland and then... From there, we took like a van to the Philadelphia airport where we then took a bus to Cape May, New Jersey, which is where the boot camp is. And that van from Maryland to Philly was nuts. There was like five of us on the van. And the dude just like looked back on us. He was like, hey, I got somewhere else to be right now. Y'all mind if I drive a little quick? And we're like, yeah, sure. This dude was doing like 85 <laughs> on the highway going up into like philadelphia we're all in the back just scared shitless just like oh no um, but we we made it there safe and sound thank god but yeah so boot camp is weird in the way that like just weird stuff happens with because of just how much stress people are under because like you know people are screaming at you you don't know what the hell you're gonna say well you know it's actually okay hold on <laughs> i'm just gonna skip ahead real quick we had like two people run away during boot camp, which was wild. The first one, he just dipped in like the first weekend, which is like the forming week kind of, where they're just like kind of just beating the hell out of you. You're just constantly doing like workouts and stuff, just like getting punished for literally nothing. And after one night and like, like right after we got beat, like outside, we were all walking back inside to go to the squad bay and he just walked away, walked to medical and was like, yep, I want to leave. I'm done. And we didn't even hear about it. He was just gone one day. I heard about it like two weeks later from someone else. I was like, really? I didn't even notice. Um, but we also like showed up there with like 120 people. So I didn't know anyone at that point. But then the other guy that ran away, he ran away at the end of uh, of week five. And week five is the hardest week of Coast Guard boot camp. We call it um, SAR week because every single day they wake you up extra early and you have to like get outside and run to the chow hall in like 10 minutes to like get up get dressed do all your shit run there in 10 minutes and at the end of the week and we all knew what was coming you know they kind of told us like ahead of time like this is the hardest week after this kind of gets easier and this one dude ran away the very last day that sunday he just ran away which was so weird because he was a really cool dude no one knew why he did what he did but he ran away in the middle of the night so at the time we were watching we were like we were like had like watch schedules like standing watch or whatever at like the in the building and after his watch, which was like midnight or something, he just grabbed his stuff, packed it up, and just walked away. And he walked off base, and he walked for 16 miles in a snowstorm, because it's like February in New Jersey, until someone picked him up on the side of the highway, brought him to the hospital. And of course, the hospital saw it was like his Coast Guard gear, and they're like, okay, and just sent him back to the base. <laughs> and no one knew why he did it. He just decided to leave one day. He was a really cool dude. He was really good at everything he did. No, no problems. Just, I don't know. Maybe he had a mental breakdown. I have no idea. He just ran away. <laughs> so for those of you that stuck around, what came next? Well, so after SAR week, it's pretty easy. That's when, like, they stop doing more beatings. You're just sort of, like, transferring more over to, like, classroom stuff. Like, the first four or five weeks are very difficult. Just lots of constant, like, exercises. They call it IT, 
which is intensive training, I think, something like that. But it's just getting beat, getting smoked. They say send you out to the outside. They do do your push ups and everything, or you stand in the middle of the quarter deck with like a big old rope, and you have to like pass it around. Or you grab like a giant rope and you have to like run to one side of the room, pull like 300 feet of rope to that side, which is like a four inch rope all around, like diameter. And then you have to just bring it back and you just keep doing it until they tell you to stop, basically, which is really cool. I never had to do it, <laughs> thankfully. Yeah, but after like the fifth week, the SAR week, it gets a lot easier. It's more just like classroom stuff, learning how to be a proper coasty, I guess. Like you're, you're learning a lot of different things. Like you go through a, a seamanship school where you're learning like how to tie knots, how to throwing, throw a heaving line to do that sort of stuff. And then you do like a firefighting school, like a very basic firefighting school where they have you like dress up in the firefighting gear and all that stuff. And then they have these like cool rooms with uh, like screens that have simulated fire on it. And you bring like actual hoses over, you get to go like spray down the fire and all that which was like really fun they had to like run like a mile away to get to that place which was annoying yeah i mean there's just like random like little classroom segments where you're just learning like this is what the ranks are blah 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 but not really that interesting we had to do like a range day where we like went to like an indoor range and they showed us how to shoot pistols which was that was fun but meh so the training Obviously, it's a branch of the military, so there's got to be some combat. You said they taught mm -hmm. you pistols. What's, like, the split on combat and then the technical stuff and then things like, you know, seafaring? So, like, combat stuff is very, very low. You get very little of that. There's a tiny bit of hand-to-hand -hand where they have you, like, you know, like, the, the pugil sticks, like, the sticks with the giant, like, cushions on each end? Mm -hmm. You get to do that one time and, like, fight other people, which is really fun. I, like, decked the crap out of a kid. <laughs> um um and then there's the pistols and that's about it you know we're not very heavy on combat in boot camp um and then i think i think like about 30 percent of your time is doing like seamanship and f damage control firefighting stuff and then the other 30 percent is probably more classroom learning how to be a coasty learning your rules and regulations and then learning like the different ranks and stuff I had a couple more boot camp stories so we i have one that i like to call the geese story because at Cape May and in a lot of Coast Guard bases for some reason, there's always tons of geese everywhere. They love it because we have like big open fields. And so they like walk all over the place. They'll like walk through the roads and they'll shit everywhere. And it's really annoying, but you can't touch them. You can never touch a goose in the Coast Guard because if you do, you get in lots of trouble because, <laughs> you know, it's an animal. And one time when we were, you know, marching through in boot camp, some geese were up ahead of us. And one of our company commanders told us to beep at the geese. And so the people in the front two rows would then have to literally beep at the geese. They'd just start screaming out, beep, beep, beep at the geese. And so this just became like the tradition. You tell us to do it and we do it. And then another day, like a couple, like a week or two later, we're like marching up to the chow hall, about to like go have lunch, I think. And one of the older company commanders is like kind of towards the front. And the guy who told us how to beep at the geese was in the back. And there was like a bunch of geese in the way of us. And with unprompted, the people in front just started beeping at the geese again. <laughs> and the older guy, the chief, was like, what the f*** are you doing? <laughs> and the other guy in the back was like, yes, yes, nailed it. Yes. <laughs> it just confused the hell out of him. But he couldn't get mad at us because he told us to do it. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my last fun boot camp story will be the muscle relaxers. So there's like a little like simple oval track that people will do laps around for like just exercise and jogging. And one day this, uh, this one girl, she was like this short Asian girl. She, she had just recently had some sort of injury, some sort of like muscle injury. I don't know. I don't remember what it was, but so she's doing laps and she just has the biggest grin on her face and you don't smile during boot camp. That's bad. That's really bad. But she was just grinning, just smiling, having the greatest time of her life. And one of the company commanders came over and was like, yo, why are you smiling so much? What's going on? She's like, petty officer so-and-so, I just had muscle relaxes, and I feel great. And he's like, dude, stop running. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to have a heart attack. <laughs> and so he had to, like, pull her off the track and, like, sit her down. So with muscle relaxers, like, can that still be dangerous to do intense exercise after an injury if you have muscle relaxers in your system? Oh, yeah, because, I mean, your heart's a muscle. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, so you have oh. muscle relaxer. You start trying to work out. Your heart's going crazy, but the muscle relaxers are doing something. I'm no doctor, but it's definitely bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll move on from boot camp. Mm -hmm. There's a couple other things, but not really much else. After boot camp, I went to my first unit, which was a big Coast Guard cutter. Big old ship. It was a 270 foot long cutter. We just call it a 270. Based up in Boston. And I just flew out there. Got to meet the new crew. Well, I flew out there and it wasn't there. It was on patrol, which I didn't know at the time. So I had to like work with some people and they like drove me up to Maine where they were stopped for a bit. And in my first week, well, my first day underway after we left from Maine was when I had my first fun, exciting story of the, the Coast Guard cutter, which was a, a big old shit story. The, the sewage system had gotten clogged up and it's because it's there's like a vacuum tank that then sucks all the sewage out from all the toilets and something had gotten clogged in there. We have no idea what it was, but something got clogged in it. And this is my first day underway. And so we had to take buckets. We have to open up the tank, use buckets to just empty out the tank. So we'd grab buckets, fill it up with all that awfulness, and then carry them outside and dump them overboard so that we could actually clear out the tank to then clear the clog. So the first day was doing that. And then eventually the clog came out. And when it came out, it just shot out because it was all pressurized. So this big foot long, whatever it was, shot out into the bucket, followed by like a torrent of shit. <laughs> and we didn't even bother finding out what it was. <laughs> and we just took it up, threw it out. And then after that, we fixed everything up and spent the, the next day after that, spent it cleaning everything because there was shit everywhere. Oh, and that was my wonderful introduction to uh, the underway life. <laughs> God damn. Yeah. I would swim back to shore, going to be honest. I was tempted, yeah. <laughs> we were we were still close to shore when it, when it happened, so I got to like go out afterwards and call my parents. Like, yeah, guess how my first day was? <laughs> yeah, I cleaned up shit for two days straight. I did get a medal for that, so that was fun. You got a medal? Oh yeah, two days out of boot, or not two days, like a week out of boot camp. <laughs> yeah, it was nothing special. It was a team commendation medal, which they give out for anything. So. That wasn't a big deal. By the time I was done on the cutter, I think I had like four of them. They're given out to like whole teams. So like our whole shop that I was a part of, we all got the same award. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was my wonderful introduction. After that, we, you know, just sailed around for like a month and then pulled back in because I, I, I showed up towards the end of the patrol. So actually with the Coast Guard, I know you patrol. What are you patrolling for? So that depends on where we are. So... Most of our patrols were actually down in the Eastern Pacific. So we'd sail down the East Coast through the Caribbean and then through the Panama Canal over there. And over there, we would do like drug interdictions. So like cocaine smugglers and all that. Mm. On the Eastern Seaboard, the East Coast, we would do like search and rescue and we would do um, fishery boarding. So just like fishing boats. We just hop on board and make sure they're not like fishing illegally because right. people do that. And like the Caribbean was mostly like search and rescue a little bit of drugs. We never really got any down there. And then migrant interdiction, which is like people on shitty little boats trying to come from Haiti to the U.S. That's that's what we do on like a Coast Guard cutter. Like search and rescue is kind of always a thing for us, just no matter where we are. It's kind of like one of our secondary missions. But like, you know, Eastern Seaboard is fisheries, Caribbeans, migrants, and then Pacific is uh, drugs. So my first full patrol with them came a few months later after that, after the last story. Where um, that summer we took a three-month patrol down to the Eastern Pacific. Um, we got to see some really cool places. Like on the, on the way to the Pacific, actually, we got to stop in like uh, Roatan and Honduras. Well, in Roatan, I did a lot, bunch of like snorkeling and my whole back got sunburned because I was snorkeling for like hours with no sunscreen. Oh, that'll do it. So my entire back was super burned and it all peeled off. It was awful. Ugh. Also, someone in Roatan managed to drink the tap water, which meant everyone got the shits for like a week straight it was so bad we were all really pissed at him but i won't say his name <laughs> <laughs> then after rotan we stopped in honduras where we were supposed to meet up with their because it was it was a honduran navy base and so on the pier when we pulled up they had like a bunch of people waiting for us they're all like standing in formation it was all fun and stuff and while we were pulling in whoever was in charge of a moving the boat, the, the con officer who makes the decisions on like what speed and heading and all that. He told them like all ahead four while we were like a hundred yards away from the dock. And the captain immediately yelled, Fuck no, and yanked the throttles back. <laughs> <laughs> and 
doing that meant that we lost control of the engines. Uh oh. So the engines were stuck in reverse until we eventually shut them off like a mile later. And then the engineers, we had to go down there. I didn't do it, but the other guys, they had to go down there and fix whatever happened to the engines to cause them to lose control. And then we eventually got back. By the time we got back to the pier, they had all left. So all like the admirals and everything that we were going to meet for this big photo op, they all left. Oh. Like, fuck this shit. <laughs> and I guess at some point later on, because we were there for a few days, at some point later on, they must have met up with them. But I felt really bad for the guys that were just standing out there in formation who had no business being there. Yeah. Just, ugh. Because it's like middle of the summer in Honduras. It's hot. Ugh. Felt so bad. And after like that, we were, this was like a week or two into the patrol. We like went through the Panama Canal, which is cool the first couple times but it takes like at least eight hours to do so so it sucks after a while but it's pretty cool it's a fun little experience I ended up doing it like six times so yeah then we got to the eastern pacific and we started doing drug interdiction which i can i can go into detail on that a little bit at least so basically like we're usually stopping most of them are like small like what we call go fast which are just little speed boats little simple open top speed boats with like two big ass outboards in the back a bunch of barrels of gasoline and then a bunch of drugs. And while we're on patrol doing this, we'll have like a separate unit that's attached to us, which is like the Hilo guys, what we call Hitron. They'll go out and like stop them and then we'll catch up and board them and take all the drugs and everything and then blah, blah, blah. I mean, like take the detainees off, take the drugs, take whatever evidence we can. And then afterwards, after we're done processing all that, then we'll basically figure out a way to get rid of the boat because we can't leave the boat out there because it's a hazard of navigation. And we're also not going to waste time bringing it back to a port and towing it because that would take forever and we have other people to go stop. So we would just sink the boats. And, and, and like the small to like medium-sized boats, like the small fishing boats, we would just like poke a bunch of holes in the hull with a big fire axe. And we take all of our extra oily rags, throw them in, and then like whatever like leftover like waste fuel we have from like testing or whatever, we dump that in there too. Take a flare, light it, and throw it in. And it was all whoosh. sounds very yeah. high tech and controlled. Oh God, yeah, so so controlled. Yeah. <laughs> we're the Coast Guard. We know what we're doing. God damn. Um, yeah, we couldn't leave it there, so we got to have fun. Sometimes we would try to uh, sink it by ramming it with the ship, <laughs> which never actually worked. Sadly, <laughs> in my <laughs> opinion, it's because they went too slow. <laughs> was this just? But were we they just bored that. and they wanted something to try? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, because we would get a little creative sometimes if we wanted to sink the boat. Like one time we tried to sink it with our main gun, which on the front of the 270 is a 76 millimeter auto cannon. Oh, damn. It shoots like one round every 0.9 seconds or something. It's like, boom, boom, boom. It's supposed to be like an anti-aircraft cannon, but it can shoot at boats too. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that the targeting system sucks mm. on it. I don't know why. It might just be the system. It might be the electrical technicians that have to work on it. I don't know. I was never really that involved with it. But one time we had a boat and we tried to sink it with that. It was like a small fishing boat, maybe like 35, 40 feet long. And so we went away like three miles away because we had to be like a safe distance or whatever. Who cares? And they loaded it up with like 20 rounds and they fired all 20 shots and they missed all 20 <laughs> shots. <laughs> By a long shot. I mean, we were watching it from outside. It's like, oh, that's, that's a mile away. That's a half mile away. Oh, that one just detonated like 100 feet off the boat. Like, oh, God. Because uh -huh. <laughs> we have like different types of rounds for it. Like some of them are just like solid shot. Some of them are high explosive. And then some of them are high explosive variable timed. And so those will explode whenever you want them to. So you can like decide on like a distance or something. But they're also kind of finicky, and they're surplus kind of ammo from the Navy, so they're old. And so when we were doing that, one of them just, like, shot out, and, like, maybe 100 yards away from our, our boat, it just pre-detonated. Oh. Which was very scary. And I don't know why people didn't talk about it more, but it scared the shit out of me. I'm so glad to know <laughs> that my tax dollars are being used to allow the Coast Guard to take pot shots at fishing boats. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, it's old ammo. It's old surplus ammo from the Navy from like way back. So, yeah. I don't know. It was it, it, the money was spent before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because like the Coast Guard boats, for the most part, are very old. Like mm -hmm. the cutter I was on like that. Um, we have like a, quite a few of those. They were built back in like the 80s. Mm. The gun on that boat 
the big main gun was made back in like the 50s shocking that it didn't have a good targeting system you know really mind-blowing yeah i know right and then there's even older cutters than that as well there's a uh, 210 foot cutters which were also built in like the 50s or 60s i think um those are actually no those are 60s and then back in the 50s they made our old high endurance cutters which those were, have all been decommissioned at this point as of a couple of years ago but they were old oh my god mm -hmm. yeah thankfully they are slowly building more but it's very slow <laughs> yeah i wanted to go back to that same boat that we shot at <laughs> because that one i think i don't remember what country it was from i still can't remember to this day but we had a running joke that patrol that like we should buy our boats from them because so we tried to shoot at it didn't hit it missed whatever we tried to ram it after that didn't sink so we threw a bunch of like f like a uh, flammable stuff into it poked the holes into the boat lit it on fire left it you know we, we like we like kind of sat there and watched it burn and kind of sink a little bit down and then our command called up the like big top command called Jayadif. And they were like, hey, um, this boat's gonna sink. Can we just leave? And they said, yeah, sure. So we just left. Two weeks later, we came back. It was still there. <laughs> just like with a little nose of it poking out. <laughs> I was like, really? So at that point, we did eventually sink it then. But like, oh my God. Yeah. Ugh. Just never sink. I think it was from Ecuador. I don't quite remember, though. We stopped at a bunch of really cool places, that patrol. We stopped at, like, Huatuco, Chiapas, which are both in, both in Mexico. And then we also got to stop in um, Golfito in Costa Rica, which is a very, very common place for Coast Guard cutters to stop in. Really cool little tiny little ocean town, basically. It's a really fun place to be. And then towards the end of the patrol, we got to stop in Miami, actually, for, like, four days, which that was fun. But I was also, like... 19 so i couldn't really do anything yeah but we still got to see like really cool places it was, it was a lot it was a lot of fun there um most of the patrol is not fun at all mm -hmm. <laughs> but we still get to see cool places i've heard a lot of my military friends express basically that this is the best tourism they've ever gotten the opportunity to do oh god yeah because i mean i've been to mexico twice i've been to costa rica that same place in costa rica like i think five times maybe i don't quite remember honestly i can't even remember how many times i don't know <laughs> And I was only in for four years. <laughs> um, I went to Curacao on another patrol. I went to Roatan. I went to, we stopped in Guantanamo Bay a few times. You know, Miami. I went to Mayport, Florida, which is like right next to Jacksonville. Yeah, saw a lot of cool places. I went to like uh, Halifax actually one time. That was when I actually, actually after I first got there. Halifax is a shithole, by the way. I would never go back. Canadians are not as nice as you'd think they would be. Oh. Yeah, we got, we got a lot of, uh, a lot of, cocaine that patrol i think we ended it with maybe i think it was three or four thousand kilos holy shit yeah <laughs> um not all of it was from us because every time a coast guard cutter goes back through the canal to like go back home like all the other boats in the area will drop all their drugs off with them so we can just all go at once and the other boats can stay in the area dude you could make the most enjoyable snowman ever made with that oh god yeah we would make thrones out of it <laughs> Oh my god! Because <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, because like when you have that much, um, you can't really hold it anywhere because eventually you run out of room. Because like, we had a couple spots where we'd like put it like in a in our like storage areas where they had locks, but eventually you run out of room, so we would put them up on like the in the hangar, which is where the helo is. And since that's an unsecured space, they'd have someone like keeping watch over it, like a watchstander, and they would get bored and they would just start like stacking them. <laughs> bricks and making a <laughs> making a throne oh my God. and they would sit there on watch on the cocaine and this is all uncut pure cocaine so this is and each each like bale is like 70 kilos or something like that like that's millions take. each yeah you're sitting on more money than you will ever make in your entire life god damn oh my gosh that was that was nuts to me whenever we would take the cocaine off the boats we would all be there to like help move it because shit's heavy mm -hmm. and we'd just be moving it like damn I'm never going to be this rich. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think any of your crew members snuck a taste? <laughs> uh, I don't think anyone did it on purpose because we would know they were they were doing regular accounts all the time to make sure nothing was touched. Yeah. Like if they suspected it, which they never did during my time there, if they suspected it, they would have searched the entire ship. Mm -hmm. Everything would, would have gotten turned on its head. All of our racks and all of our lockers, everything would have gotten turned inside out if anything was lost. 
but thankfully that never happened the, though there are like stories from the past that i had heard of people doing it and it's just stupid because i mean people are checking constantly however <laughs> if you do want to somehow get cocaine in the in the coast guard the best way to do it is if while you're moving these bales someone accidentally drops one and it gets caught on something and tears open and falls on you then you can't get in trouble for that it's an accident and that also means that for six months after that you can't be drug tested <laughs> 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 Wait, have an addiction you need to take care of just douse yourself in spilled cocaine <laughs> pretty much yeah um, <laughs> um i only had it spilled on me once and i didn't I, I didn't like really do anything about it and i never really did anything like extra afterwards it's not even like for the record like i just didn't because i don't know i'm a loser <laughs> <laughs> Like, I tell you what, when that shit drops on you, you move those bales really fast. Yeah. It doesn't even feel like 70 kilos anymore. <laughs> Did you actually get a contact high off of it? No, not really. I mean, uh, I, I think one of them burst open on us and I got like a little bit and it was like a little tingly or whatever. But like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was still a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, sometimes like, because like the bales are big man they're big you know, it's 70 kilos. And so like inside those bales are a bunch of little bricks. Mm-hmm. And each one is like individually wrapped and all that. And sometimes like the cartels would do like fun little wrapping jobs. It was like Christmas presents almost. <laughs> and they'd do like wrapping jobs. They put like pictures on them and shit. Like one of them had like Pablo Escobar on it or El Chapo's picture on it and stuff like that. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Most of what we got was cocaine. We sometimes, a couple times we got marijuana, but I mean, that's really not a big trade for them because no. we can grow it here but yeah that patrol we got a lot and when we actually when we got back to miami to offload it all we had like a whole um whole event like the news people were there like there was cameras there was reporters and everything there was like a helicopter flying up over above taking pictures so we all had to like stand there in like a nice little formation in front of like our big stash of drugs that we had like laid out on the flight deck I i'm imagining like you take the cocaine throne and you like have people like bring it up on you know the sticks with the platform that's used in like yeah. for royalty. You just take that and you have the whoever's in command <laughs> sit on it. <laughs> oh, that would have been great. Oh my god, why didn't we ever think of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have pictures of myself laying on top of cocaine. It's, oh my it's gosh, beautiful. dude! If you send me that and blur your face, that would be legendary. <laughs> I'm tempted, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> I might actually do it. Yeah, I can I can figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's I have, I have a few different pictures. I have like one like me like in like our storage room basically where I'm like kind of like laying back with my hands like this like <laughs> ah. And then I have like another one when when it was up when they were up on the hangar just like laid out in like a big line like three stacked high and I'm just like laying down on it like with my like hand like this just like staring at the camera. It's it's great. That's yeah. wild. I'll, uh... <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll have to find those. I'll send them to you. It's great. Yeah, we, we would get a lot of cocaine on those patrols, you know? And then the funny part is, is that we're not even getting all of it. For each boat that we would stop, 10 more would get by us. Like, it, the, the amount of those boats going by every single day is insane, you know? Because, like, there's only so much that we can do as one cutter. You know, we stop one person, it takes us like a day, a full 24 hours sometimes, depending on how big the boat is, to actually like process everything, get everything off, get all the evidence, and then get rid of them and do yeah. all that crap. I mean, clearly it's still profitable for them, so like... Yeah, I guess so, yeah. I mean, they, I, I think for them, like us stopping one of their boats is just the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. You know, like with how many that we're going by every single day, like there's no way we're going to stop all of them. Hi, I'm Azeel, and I'm currently not on a three-day cocaine bender in the Bahamas. If you're also not on a cocaine bender in the Bahamas, you should subscribe to my Patreon. Top tier patrons get to join me in VR chat, which is available both in VR and on flat screen and desktop mode, to watch people tell their stories live and ask them questions. Patrons can also join my Discord community and come to parties in VR chat to hang out with me and other supporters. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you there. Yeah. You know, so they, they, they send out one, like, I, I think sometimes, I wouldn't be surprised if they got caught on purpose with like just like a little bit of drugs all like the really heavy loaders can just go by you know i wouldn't be surprised if they did that I'm, i was never on the intel side so i have no idea but yeah mm -hmm. 
the intel that we would have on these guys was insane though i'm pretty sure we had people on the inside because sometimes like on the boardings our guys would be in there like i was never on the boarding team but i heard from them like they'd be on the on the boat and, like maybe it's like kind of like a bigger fishing boat or something searching around they're not seeing shit whatever so they call back to the boat or to the, to the cutter and they're like okay we'll find out from jayadev so like they call back to main command like jayadev and they're like yeah we can't find anything so jayadev has like the fucking floor plan and they're like look behind that wall and so they look behind there and there's just fucking cocaine like damn i don't know how the hell they know it i don't know where they get the intel from but it's scary how much they know yeah and like I, I always feel bad personally for most of the guys that we would catch on these boats because like realistically they're not the big bad guy you know these are usually some dudes from some village or city or whatever who are pretty poor and the cartel comes along and says hey run these drugs for us and you'll get money or hey run these drugs for us or we'll kill your family you know something like that they give them incentive or they give them there's a carrot or a stick there yeah either one either way these guys are usually very desperate they're not the big bad they're just guys trying to get by mm -hmm. so i always felt really bad for them you know we'd always treat them fairly well as long as they were nice to us you know a couple times we managed to like find someone that like jadaf knew about and they were like oh that's the big bad guy right he's like, he's like <laughs> a captain or whatever and we're like oh my god um but the vast majority of them were just regular people you know i always felt bad but on the other hand, they, they do have some options when they eventually get back to the U.S. You know, they could either end up in prison for the rest of their life or they could become like an informant or something like that. Right. So who knows? I, I never knew about what happened to them after that. I don't know. But I always thought it'd be really kind of shitty if you ended up being an informant because like you get back to your cartel and they just look at you like the Coast Guard stopped you and they sent you back home. <laughs> okay. Bang. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh you know, like, I don't know. I don't know how that works out. <laughs> so, oh, I'll do some search and rescue stuff. We'll go over that. Because the fisheries are so boring. Fisheries are super boring. We do, like, a bunch of them each day. They just board and check their check their fish, make sure they're the right size, make sure their nets aren't illegal or whatever. That's boring shit. Um, search and rescue is interesting, though. Like, um, my first patrol, actually, that, that same summer patrol. On the way down, it was July 4th. We were planning to have, like, a little cookout on the boat while we were off the coast of Florida. It's going to be kind of fun, blah, blah, blah. And we get a call saying that there was like a boat full of Haitian migrants that had tried to come up and they got hit by a storm and then they got picked up by a cargo ship. So we had to like go pick them up and send them there. And there was like, I think 20 or 21 of them on this like original little tiny motorboat. And when the storm came, they lost one of the guys. He was gone. And the rest of them like climbed back on the boat and shit. What was really nuts about them was that like they had left from Haiti and instead of going like northwest ish to Florida, they just went straight north. So they ended up like 300 miles off the coast of Georgia. Whoa. Just way out there. Yeah, it was nuts. And, you know, and it, what was really scary to me was honestly like one of these people, they had like a little baby. They had like a little like a uh, toddler with them. I felt so bad for that kid, you know, like living through all that shit. Oh, God. It shows like <laughs> these people don't do this because they want a nice tourist trip or to like do something for fun they're no. doing it because they need to survive no yeah they're they're desperate they're mm -hmm. desperate for it yeah yeah and like our first uh my patrol down in the caribbean we uh we had one big migrant case that we got there so it was like a 45 maybe 50 foot and maybe like 40 to 45 foot sailboat right and what they had done to it was i like chopped the mast off and then threw like a little tiny tiny outboard on the back of it mm-hmm and then they stuff the people in there, like fucking sardines. I want you to take a guess how many people there were. You said 50-foot boat? 40 to 45. Okay. I'm going to say 200 people. God damn it. It was like 185. Oh, I almost nailed it. <laughs> yeah, it was 185 of them or God 186, damn. somewhere in that range. Yeah, they're packed in there like sardines. Like a 40-foot boat is not that big. Like that that fucking thing right there, that little that boat, the ones that goes through the big Venice, that's oh, like yeah. 30. Mm -hmm. it's a bit bigger than that and it's a sailboat so they have like a little underneath space but 180 people like on our cutter the 270 foot cutter we had 100 that's ridiculous yeah and we were packed in there like sardines <laughs> in our little birthing areas yeah when we got there the people they started it was like the middle of the night when we got there and they just started like jumping off like trying to get to us and we're like, stop jumping in the water, because if you do, we're not going to be able to find you. It's like pitch black out here. It was scary as hell. Yeah, we had like our small boat out there. Like we dropped that in the water and they were just like ferrying people back and forth just all night. You know, um, I think we were kind of close to the Turks and Caicos. 
And so they sent their Coast Guard out as well. They had like a big ship as well. And they were taking people too, you know, because we couldn't take all of them. That was a shitload of people. Yeah. Like I remember at one point, um, we brought them back on board and just to show you how desperate people are, they would oftentimes fake medical issues to try to get like expedited back to the U S and it was really easy to tell. Cause like we had a, we had a doctor on board and this one woman, like, just like as, as soon as she got on board, she just laid down and started like convulsing mm-hmm. and then like stayed still. Our doc went over and she, she showed me this trick where they just take a pen and they press it against the top of like your nail and they press down and it, it's, it, it hurts like a motherfucker. <laughs> And so, of course, the girl just jumps up. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone's constantly faking stuff. Some people go beyond faking, though. They'll, like, go all the way. They'll, like, swallow cutlery and shit. Oh, my God. Like, they'll swallow forks and shit. Yeah, it's bad. So, like, every time we'd have to, like, feed them, you'd have to check and, like, count and make sure you have all of your cutlery. Because people would just swallow it to try to, like, f*** themselves up to get sent back to the U.S. Wow. Because they're that desperate to go. Yeah, like, we had, a, we had like, a little train that we would go through before any patrol down south like that or for expecting to do migrants or something. It was a man- manifestation of fear training. Where they'd have this, like, it was, like, a pretty old video. They'd basically t- tell us how to, like, look out for signs of people being in fear who might be, like, under threat or something and how to go through all of it. And we'd always have to, like, list- watch that video anytime. And, you know, you see it sometimes with some people. They're, they're scared shitless. They can't go back home because, like, there's gangs or mafias or whatever. Or whatever. I don't know. Mm-hmm. There's all sorts of reasons for them. And that's the thing with, like, a lot of these migrants and, like, detainees from, like, drug boats. is there. It's always, like, a case-by-case basis, like, per person. You know, you have no idea if it's everyone's going to get sent back or some people are going to get sent back. Some people are going to the U.S. It's case-by-case. Like, every single person gets processed uniquely, which is nice, you know? I know you're not a customs officer, but do we have, like, laws for <laughs> asylum? Yeah. Yeah, we do. That was part of like the training that we would go through. They wouldn't like go into like super detail. This is more for like general knowledge for us. But like, yeah, some people would be seeking asylum. You know, they'd pass a note to you or something. If they can't say anything, they'd pass a note like, I'm seeking asylum. I need to go home. I need to go to the U.S. or whatever. Like if they're if they're fearing for their lives, you know, they get asylum. But yeah, I never really had to like get super involved in that because that was just never my thing. Never my job. So yeah, that, uh, that, that big migrant case with like 180 people, we had them on board just overnight. And then the next morning we like just shuttled them off to the Turks and Caicos and they took care of them from there actually. Cause when we found them, they were in their waters. I think it was like their jurisdiction, mm-hmm. but if it's, if, if it was international waters, we, we most likely would have taken them back to the U S and from there they would have been processed more. I've got some other search and rescue ca- cases that were not migrants. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I've got one that I like to call two Georgians on a boat. I think it was three of them. I don't quite remember. It was Georgians on a boat. So this is Georgians like the country, not the state. It's like Republic of Georgia or whatever. Um, so anyways, this, the story goes basically that this Russian dude up in Canada, like I think he was like outside of Halifax or something. He wanted a sailboat. So he called up some Georgian dudes all the way like from Georgia, like Black Sea right next to Ukraine, flew them over to, I think it was Dominican Republic. They took this sailboat, started sailing it up. They got caught in a storm around Bermuda or something, had to stop the repairs, which is what made them suspicious to us. And then they continued all the way. And so we went out there to go check on them, like when they're off the East Coast. And these dudes were Georgians, so they didn't know shit for English. Thankfully, we had like a Ukrainian guy on board. <laughs> We've had a few Ukrainians, actually. He actually ended up translating for us. And like these guys were just chilling on a boat. They had some like fresh fiberglass. We thought maybe they had like thrown drugs in and like covered it up or whatever. Nothing. We didn't find anything. We didn't find any traces because we have like things that will test for like traces, like not even like particles basically of cocaine. And we didn't find anything and they didn't have an extinguisher. So we gave them like an expired one from our small boat, (laughs) which I kind of felt bad for, but you know, um, we heard later on actually about this one that they had made it to Canada where the Mounties stopped them when they pulled in, tore the boat apart, literally tore it apart piece by piece, like completely ruined the thing, still found nothing. I felt kind of bad for them, but yeah. We had another search and rescue case, that same patrol. This was like a couple of years after I first got there. Um, we had another search and rescue case on that same patrol on the East Coast where this dude like called home. He like called his mom from like a boat, like a sailboat or whatever. And he was like, mom, I'm scared for my life. I think I'm going to die out here and blah, blah, blah. Didn't say much else. So the mom called the Coast Guard and said, like, my son's life is in danger. Ah. So we go out there and investigate. We, we catch up to them. 
And it turns out the dude was just scared because he was in a storm. Whereas we were thinking that whoever was with him on the boat was about to kill him. And then we looked at like the weather reports and there was like two to three foot waves, which is nothing. Mm -hmm. So this guy got a little shower, got scared shitless, called his mom. Mom called us and we went out there for nothing. Oh, <laughs> I kind of felt bad for him. But at the same time, I hated him because it took like four days for us to get there. And like we did like calculations afterwards, actually. Because me being in engineering was, I was kind of close with like engines and fuel and all that stuff. Our uh, our fuel guy, the guy, the fuel king is in charge of transferring all that. He like took a log of how much fuel we had used over those few days and counted it up. And it came out to like $50,000 worth of fuel oh. that we used just to get to him. <laughs> We were like, holy shit, we just wasted that much taxpayer money for literally nothing. There's a lot of money being wasted in the military. Go figure. Wowzers. Oh, yeah. That's nothing. <laughs> yeah. So between search and rescue and the drug busts, like, which would you say makes you feel like you've done more good overall? Like, which do you prefer? Search and rescue. I never really had any, like, I had one serious case. Most of them were pretty like false flags or whatever but i had one serious case but like for the most part search and rescue makes you feel a lot better about yourself at least i don't know if that sounds selfish or whatever but it makes you feel better because you're just helping someone they were stuck and you just came to their rescue you know it feels nice yeah and oftentimes people are like scared shitless in the middle of the water their boats broken down or whatever you know you know the coast guards we're we're the ones that go out there in the storm that's the thing like we have not i was never on those boats but we have boats that are meant to go out in like freaking hurricanes like they're meant to be able to like flip over and then right themselves and keep going through like 20 foot waves and massive amounts of wind you know mm -hmm. so that that does feel good when you get to like actually help someone yeah um i had one one search and rescue case that went bad it was uh it was actually totally impromptu it was weird so this was after i was on the cutter this is when i was at the ace navigation team and while we were there we we're just like basically working on like buoys and day marks and whatever making sure like all these like lights and stuff are there so that people can navigate through the water and we had just finished working an area for a day where we had been out there like eight hours or something we had just finished up we had pulled the boat back up on our trailer we we're about to like drive away and like one of the guys was like in the shitter or something like a, a porta potty and we heard some like yelling at the other side of the parking lot because it's like it's kind of like a little like inlet and then the parking or like the, there's like a parking lot boat ramp little inlet and then it goes out to like the, the bay there and we heard all this like yelling and commotion on the other side of the parking lot so a couple of us ran over there to go look at it my boss he was like just a bit ahead of me he saw what was going on turned around was like get the fucking boat back in the water so we had to go run back over there. I didn't. I still didn't know what was going on. I knew something was happening though. So I backed the boat back into the water with the with the truck, launched them. A couple of them went in the boat. Me and one of the other guys, we ran across the parking lot to go see what was happening. It was this dude who had been swimming around at the beach, just like like a hundred yards away, and his dog had swam out into the water. And this this spot is right at a little, a little inlet where the currents are super strong. Like they will suck you out. And it doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are. Dogs on the other hand, like this lab that this guy had, great swimmers. They can float forever. They're amazing at this. So the dog was fine. The guy, however, drowned. So then a guy with a jet ski picked him up and then drove him over to where like the inlet was like beached himself up there and brought the guy off and the cops came and they were doing like, like CPR and shit. So then our boat, our little like little uh, Aton boat, they uh, they came around, beached themselves, and um, since like the hill right there going up to the parking lot was way too steep, like the EMTs that eventually showed up, they were like, no, we're not carrying them up there. So we were like, hey, we have this boat right here, and it's got a nice little flat area, so you can like lay them down and shit. And they're like, yep, let's do that. So we put them in there, and we drove across the inlet because there was like a boat ramp right there, and pulled them over there. They pulled them out, put them up in the ambulance, and that was it. Um, I, I I helped like. I helped carry him up into the boat and then I rode with them and helped them carry him back out to the ambulance. Yeah. He was super pale, like super pale. It was scary. Yeah. I remember most is that he, he was so cold, you know, and this was like middle of the summer in Virginia, not normally cold. It was pretty hot out that day, but his skin was ice cold, ice cold. Cause like his, he kind of bumped up against me when I was like carrying the stretcher up. It was oof, scary. You know, it's like, it's, it's one of those things that, you know you may or may not see in the coast guard you know not everyone does but we're a lot more likely to see that just because of the nature of the coast guard you know 
Um, there's a lot of people in in the Coast Guard that have seen way more than I have. <laughs> you know, like um, guys who were stationed. Oh, a couple guys I knew that were stationed in the past at uh, San Francisco. They have a small boat station there. And people love to jump off that bridge. People love it. Mm. Not because they really want to survive the fall, but that's a really great spot to do it because it's a really fucking high bridge. And when you hit the water going fast enough, it's like concrete. Yeah, I knew I, there's a couple of guys there that had done that and pulled a lot of bodies out of the water, you know. One of the one of the other guys at the ace navigation team, we call it the ant team. I'll, I'll say that from now on. <laughs> he had been at a small boat station up in Long Island, and he told me about a story where this couple I think they were like kind of middle-aged or whatever, like 40s, 50s. They had been on like a speedboat, you know, going around. And I think, I don't remember what exactly happened. I don't know if they hit another boat or if one of them fell out of the boat or whatever. I think they got hit by another boat. I don't quite remember. But they got chopped up by that boat. Like the propellers, they got chopped up. Yeah. My buddy told me about how like he had like pull them out and be like super careful because he didn't want them like fall apart while he was pulling them out. Yeah. So me touching a cold body that... We don't know if he made it or not because we never heard anything. I figure that's not so bad because I can sit here and be ignorant and pretend like I have no idea what happened to him because I don't know what happened to him afterwards. We didn't hear any news, which I'm not sure if it's, if it's good or bad. It just is what it is. So, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like so much of this job is just accepting the fact that you can't do everything, but you're doing some good along the way. Yeah. Yeah. You, you you kind of accept that, you know, like you're not going to get everyone. You're not going to save everyone. But when you do, it's amazing. That's that's a really good part. Um, one of one of this goes back to actually boot camp, a story that one of our company commanders told us. And it was basically like him, like the moral of the story was just being clear and direct about what you're saying. Speak clearly and loudly because people would scream and like, blah, 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 blah. you can't understand things they're saying so he told us a story because he was a an aviation guy so he would um, basically be like the winch operator on the search and rescue helicopters and he was at an air station they got a call that some kid had gotten like dragged out on the beach or something i think it was like in the carolinas or something but this kid had gotten like dragged out on a beach during like, this big family get together and so the um, 911 operator gave them the um like the grid square to like go search for this kid and they get there and they see nothing, like literally nothing. And they're like, what the fuck? So they call back and they're like, hey, we don't see shit. And they're like, oh, the 911 operator said seven instead of one or some shit like that. They misunderstood them. They were one number off. And because of that one number, they were too late and the kid drowned and died. Wow. And I remember him telling us like he still, every single time he still sees like the same color of teal that that kid's shorts were, like the demons just come rushing back. Mm. Yeah, that was our story for um, that was our lesson to not to oh, just, just, just to speak clearly. <laughs> Had a lot of people crying after that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and one of the things you learn in the military, and I think I've heard this from other branches, is that when you're late, people die. <laughs> and it rings true a lot with search and rescue, because if you're late to pick that guy out of the water, he's dead. You know, people don't last long when they're drowning. They don't last long at all. So and what a way to go too. oh, yeah. I would, I would hate that, you know? Yeah. Someone like me that is genuinely terrified of the ocean should not have been on a big cutter, but I somehow just didn't pay attention to how I was terrified of the ocean because it's terrifying. Yeah. (laughs) So I just forgot about how scary it was. And I was like, I'm on this nice boat. I'm going to ignore how scary everything around me is. I'm just going to stay in this boat. I would be completely fine with being on a boat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and swimming off like 50 feet and just vibing in the middle of the water. (laughs) <laughs> we we did that a couple times really yeah we'd have a swim call basically um we did like in we did it like a, once in the caribbean a couple times in the pacific yeah oh huh. yeah so if there's like nothing going on that day then it's like a weekend day like a sunday or saturday they would just like stop the boat in the middle of the ocean be like all right we're having a swim call everyone who can if you're not on watch then yeah then you just go and you jump off the boat you get to jump off a flight deck which is like 30 feet up so it's like a really far drop and yeah you get to just jump off the boat and swim around in the middle of the ocean you know and i remember after like like one time i asked like the the captain or something he was out there like one of like the deck guys i think i was like hey like how deep is this water right now and they're like oh it's like 16 18 thousand feet and i was like oh <laughs> that's just the abyss yeah <laughs> 
there's nothing there. There's just water and that's it. Yeah. yeah. Any any time we would do a swim call, we would have the uh one of our small boats out in the water, just like kind of like chilling out there in case someone started drowning or some shit. Which if you're in the Coast Guard and you're drowning, there's an issue. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun though, you know, you just get to like swim out there and it's really fun to jump off. We didn't get to do it nearly as much as I would would have liked, in all honesty. Hmm. And I, I do have a fun <laughs> a fun swim call story. This is actually went like really popular in the Coast Guard um a couple of years ago, I think. This other boat, this wasn't my boat, this is a different one. They were having a swim call. And you know, they had their uh <laughs> they had their small boat out. One dude had like a, a pink flamingo floaty or some shit. And all of a sudden you see this shark oh. swimming around them. And while we're doing this, we have a shark watch out there. And our shark watch is a dude standing out there with a M4. <laughs> And so when this shark came swimming up, and there's a video of it out there somewhere. Um, I'm sure you could probably find it, like Coast Guard shark attack or some shit. I don't know. But I've seen the video. And this this shark comes up, and they just start lighting it the fuck up. <laughs> they just start shooting the hell out of this shark. I have no idea if they hit it, but they definitely scared it away. Yeah. And it was, it was sketchy, too, because, I mean, this shark was, like, right next to the people swimming. So they were shooting right next to them, yeah. like, a couple feet away. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, thank God that never happened to us because, oh my, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> I would be more terrified of the friendly fire than the shark. Yeah, me too. Because the shark's going to get scared by it. It's going to run away. Mm. You know, it's getting shot at by 5.56. Five, five, it's running. I'm getting shot at by 5.56. Five, five, I'm running too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting back on the ship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fuck that. Yeah. Swim, yeah, swim calls are a lot of fun though. Um, yeah, I got some like videos of me. Because like, we had like uh, these these flight nets that were like usually sitting like upright along the sides of the uh, flight deck. And during like, if, if we had like a helicopter taking off or landing, we'd set them out and they'd like sit sideways out like that, basically to like catch someone if they fall off during the flight quarters or mm. the helicopter starts falling off, it can kind of maybe catch them. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but during the swim call, we'd also lay them down and I just like, hang. you can like lay in them like a hammock. <laughs> Cause it's, it's like a metal frame with a big net in the middle. So you can just lay in it like a hammock. Living the good life. A couple times I would just like climb over the side of the flight net and just hang it on from underneath <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, my friend who's been watching has a question if you'd like to ask it. Have you ever done any joint missions with the other branches? Um, so not really anything like truly operational. Like sometimes the Coast Guard does work with other branches. Like um, for us... There was one time on like a, another patrol when we were off the coast of Florida, I think it was, and we had like army rangers with their like little, little little bird helicopters. They came and did like flight ops with us. They was like landing and taking off, and there was like three of them just like constantly like land, take off, land, take off, and it's like all that shit. They did it for like hours. It was really cool. We sometimes meet up with the Navy um, in the Eastern Pacific because they have like the big tanker ships. So if we didn't want to pull in, but we needed fuel, we would just do a fueling at sea, mm. which was always very sketchy um, because you have two giant boats trying to maintain a perfect course next to each other. Yeah. Yeah. One one guy actually um, got his hand partially degloved during that. Oh. Um, during one of those operations. Yeah. Because they have to like throw a line over and then we put that in like a little pulley to then try to pull the line over to like pull the hoses over and they're all very heavy and the boats are moving and you don't stand a chance against two several thousand ton boats moving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so when you're holding onto that rope, this dude was holding onto it and his hand got pulled into the pulley block oh. and it partially degloved his fingers a little bit. It was uh. bad. Yeah. Us personally though, aside from that sort of stuff, we didn't really do much like joint operations with the Navy. Um, I know they had a couple boats down there in the Eastern Pacific that, um, cause we have like kind of special forces in the Coast Guard. They were, oh my God, what was the name of them? Jesus Christ. They're Tacklet. They're called Tacklet. <laughs> it's like tactical law enforcement team, basically. So they w would be like a detachment of specially trained guys who are meant to go on boardings, like these drug boardings, like more like high intensity stuff. Um, and sometimes they would be like detached and sent out with us or they get sent on like Navy boats and stuff because the Navy doesn't have authority to do, to do law enforcement. They need us to do that. But sometimes they would get sent out on Navy boats, spend some time there, and then they get transferred to our boat, spend some time with us. And just get like they, they would just like boat hop for like six months <laughs> with all their guys, all their gear and everything. It was really cool. You know, some of them were cool. Some of them were assholes. It's just kind of how it is. They would always take up all the all the space in our lounges which was super annoying because <laughs> they didn't have anything to do. They don't have like watch to stand or anything. So if we're not doing anything, they don't have a work day really. 
they just work out in the gym and then lay in our lounge and watch TV, which was always very annoying. Imagine having tourists on your Coast Guard boat down. <laughs> That's what it felt like sometimes. Uh, we do actually do that sometimes. It's called the Tiger Cruise, mm. where um, people from the boat, if we stop at like, uh, like say we stopped in Florida, which is what we did one time, then you have family members or friends or family members. Each person can like choose one person basically to bring on board. And they sail with you for a few days until you get like to the home port or whatever. We did that one time, actually. It was uh, it was before COVID. After COVID, we never got to do it again. But mm -hmm. it was a fun little thing, you know? Yeah. Get to show your parents the boat and how it works. And, you know. Ooh, I'll go over the, the living space in the Coast Guard Cutter. So on the 270, at least, the, the other boats are different. But the 270s, um, you have um, five main berthings for like the lower enlisted. So you have forward berthing. You have um, senior petty officer berthing is like kind of in the middle. And in the back, you have aft berthing. Those are like the big ones. These, those are like 21 person berthings, like small room, 21 beds, like stacked three high. Like you have no room at all. And then there was like the 12 man and nine man berthings. So 12 man was like a bit more roomy, but you still have like three stacked beds. Same thing with nine man, which is usually where like the, the woman slept because there was just less of them on board. Then if you're a chief, you get to have your own little stateroom, which is like a nice little dorm room, basically, um, with like a double bunk bed. So you sleep with one other person in there. Um, there's like a few of those in the back. And then the officers sleep in staterooms on the upper level, like the O2 deck or the O1, O1 deck. That's what it was called. So like the junior officers, they'd have to like have a roommate. And the senior officers, like the captain, XO, engineering officer and operations officer, they all had like their own staterooms to themselves. The, uh, the food was always okay. <laughs> um it really depended on your cooks some of them were like really good cooks really passionate about it some were like too passionate that thought they were like the next coming of gordon ramsay <laughs> um, um <laughs> which they never were <laughs> um, and then some of them were just cooks because the if you go to be a cook in the coast guard you get a really nice signing bonus Mm. of like 20k if you don't have a degree and then 40k if you have a culinary degree damn so some people would join just for the, be a cook just for that so they'd be a really shitty cook but they would also drive a tesla so, <laughs> 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 yeah yeah but we we managed to get some pretty decent food on board you know um every so often there was mystery meat but for the most part, it was pretty decent. Yeah, any, any other questions you had? Other than the shark incident, did you ever have any other aquatic animal encounters? Oh, people would always try to catch fish from the boat. We would have like a fish call, which is just like, they would just like kind of slow down and people would just throw rods off the back and try to catch shit. Nobody ever caught anything Aww. until like one day we were, we were anchored off of uh, Puerto Rico in like a little bay there because we were doing storm avoidance because there was some big storm blowing through the Caribbean. And my chief managed to catch this fish. And it was like foot and a half long or whatever. And he, he caught it, pulled it on board, put it on the deck. I managed to get a picture of it too. And then to kill it, he took a pipe wrench and just beat the oh, shit out of it. Oh, Jesus. A few times. And then it was sitting there still twitching and he went, Ah, it's still alive. Threw it back in the water. No. <laughs> Where it just floated to the top and sat there. Poor thing. <laughs> one time I saw one of those sunfish. You know, like the really big round ones with like yeah. two fins that look really stupid. Yeah, they are really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing a we were doing a man overboard drill and one of them was just chilling at the surface, just kind of flopping around. We couldn't even understand what it was until we got close. We were like, oh, shit, it's a sunfish, which we did not expect to see off the coast of, like, Massachusetts. It was weird. And then, like, one of the other guys told me a story about how sunfish one time had gotten caught up in the propeller of the boat. Ooh. <laughs> but he just told me, he was like, yeah, something was caught up in the prop, so we sent, like, a little GoPro camera down there. And when we looked at the footage, we just saw this giant, dumbass-looking fish wrapped around the propeller. Oh, man. Like, oh, no. I think they're pretty. They're nice, but they look really stupid because they are stupid. They have tiny smooth brains. Yeah. <laughs> 2D brain. Yeah. They're like the opposite of the orca. Pretty yeah. Much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not much else interacting with the wildlife, although not sea wildlife, though, actually. Because when I was at the ant team doing ace navigation stuff, there'd be like, we would go to like what's called day marks, which are just like poles with big signs. Sometimes they'd have like a light on top. And like the bigger ones would kind of have like a standing platform on it. 
And so all the time, ospreys would make nests on these things and they would make big ass nests. They would cover the whole goddamn thing. You know, it'd be like the size of this little bridge right here. You know, you could Damn. stand inside the nest. And so we would never like mess with them if there were birds in the nest, obviously, you know, we're not going to around with live birds because often oftentimes they'd have like little chicks and stuff but after they were gone we'd go up there and tear that shit down and it, i mean you know they're gone they migrate for the winter or whatever so they're not coming back until next year right and they're also blocking a very important navigational light <laughs> ah so has to happen it's unfortunate people always go like oh you're destroying the bird nets i'm like they're gone they've been gone for like a month it's okay they moved out yeah it's fine. The, the the AIDS navigation team is why I now hate seagulls a lot. Because sometimes we'd have to climb on like the really big giant buoys because they'd have like a light on top of it. And we'd have to check the light or change it out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And those birds love buoys because it's out in the middle of the water and they get to stand on something. And so they shit all over them <laughs> to the point where there would be like an inch, inch and a half thick layer of guano oh. covering the whole goddamn thing. It smelled so bad. There were a couple times when I had to climb up there and I didn't have my coveralls on. I just had like a normal uniform. I was like, oh, that's ruined. Great. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, seagulls. I smell like actual shit now. <laughs> oh, I have a question. Yeah. Is the supply of fresh water limited or do you have desalination on board? So we actually have desalination on board. Um, we have what we call a reverse osmosis machine, mm -hmm. which actually was one of my things I was responsible for okay. as part of uh, my shop's responsibilities. Basically, it just like pulls water up out of the ocean, just normal seawater, uh, sends it through a couple filters, and then it, like it's like really highly pressurized and forced through these membranes that takes all the salt particulates and bacteria and anything. And it also get brominated. So you use bromine to basically clean it and make sure that there's no algae being grown in there. Because the water sits in the tanks a long time. We'd have like big tanks that it would get fed into. And so you'd have to brominate that and make sure no algae grows in there. So yeah. Whenever you show up to one of those old Coast Guard cutters though, you like your first report, they'll have you like sign something that says, I understand that I might drink lead <laughs> lead induced water <laughs> oh because some of those pipes are very old and they think there might be lead in them so funky i spent three years on one who knows <laughs> just literally just a debuff yeah permanently <laughs> so you worked with the desalination machines what other stuff were you responsible for maintaining so my shop on the cutter was basically called a gang just like the nickname for it, but it was auxiliary department, basically. Mm -hmm. Auxiliary division of the engineering department. Everything mechanical outside of the engine room was our responsibility. So we'd work on the water system. We'd do the ACs. We'd do, we'd help with the sewage. That wasn't our main responsibility, but it was in our spaces. So we'd help them with it because there were other guys that would work on the sewage. And then we work on the, uh, the salt water systems, which is called the ASW system, which was always a fun one. Um, we'd have a uh, stabilizing fins on either side. We'd have to maintain those. We were also in charge of the helicopter fueling. So we use a fuel called JP5. Um, I know other branches use different fuel for their helicopters, but we use JP5 on the Coast Guard cutters. We were in charge of maintaining that system, like uh, testing all the fuel like regularly. And then like when a helicopter was on board, we were fueling it. You know, we get to go up under the blades while it's still running on deck and plug up the fuel and all that. It's it was a lot of fun. Uh, what else? We were in charge of like the, the hangar. It moves, it retracts and extends and it opens and closes. We had to take care of that. Um, there were two small boats on the boat. We had to maintain those plus the cranes or the davits that would move those boats. We'd do that. We have to maintain the compressed air system. There's compressed air system that runs throughout the entire boat. Maintain that. The emergency diesel generator, which is like our backup generator. Do that. And we'd also do like the steering system all the way back out of this giant hydraulic system we'd have to take care of. And I think that's about it. Oh, oh the ship's horn. <laughs> the ship's whistle. Uh, I think that's about it, if I remember correctly. Um, oh, the refrigerators. All of the refrigerators throughout the boat, we'd have to do that. All like the, the AC, the fan, the heating and cooling, all that stuff. Like all the ducting and oh, ugh. So It sounds like now that you're out, you must have a lot of very job-ready skills because you were in such a broad area of engineering. Yeah. So yeah, I was doing a lot of mechanical and engineering sort of stuff, which is actually what I'm trying to sort of get into. I'm 
actually studying to be an engineer now I'm using my GI bill like a good boy. Mm. Um, trying to be an electrical engineer, but we'll see how I go with the math. I'm kind of struggling, <laughs> but yeah, it did, it did spark a lot of interest with like just mechanical work in general. Um, I definitely don't want to be a mechanic as my day job because I did enough of that in the coast guard and it sucked, but I still like enjoy it as like a hobby. You know, like I have a car that I work on, I have, like an old car that I like to work on a lot. Um, I actually bought that while I was in the coast guard because I was like, ah, f it, I got money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> bought an old 1988 Mazda RX-7. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. So it, it did it did spark a lot of interest for me, you know, gave me a lot of good skills. I can work with my hands a lot better now. Um, I always kind of had an interest in that. You know, I, I used to work on bikes as a kid and stuff. But in the Coast Guard, I learned a lot more about it. So that was really cool. Have you ever gone through the dreaded Bermuda Triangle? <laughs> yeah, we, we went up and down there a lot. Um, nothing really happened in there. I don't know if it's true or not. I'd like to believe it's true, but we definitely f sailed through there quite a bit and never really had much happen. We've hit rough weather there before. Like, um, my very last patrol, we had stopped in Florida after we offloaded all our drugs and everything. And we were about to leave. It was like, a, just like a, a day stop. Basically we pulled in the morning. We we're planning to leave that afternoon and our command came down. They're like, Hey, there's a giant storm about to hit. So we can either sit here and wait for the storm to blow over, but then we'll be late for Christmas. Or we just send it, hug the coast, and just ride it out, and we make it home for Christmas. So everyone said, fuck it, let's just go. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, that morning, it was beautiful, sunny, beautiful, sunny Florida. Pulled in there. Had a great time. It was right outside Miami. I think it was, like, Fort Lauderdale. And right as we left the, the port, literally 10 minutes out, not even... We got out of the port, out of the channel, giant thunderstorm, massive waves, huge amounts of wind. It was insane. It just came out of absolutely nowhere. And then it was like that for the next three days straight. And I'm not someone that normally gets like seasick whatsoever, but that shit f***ed me up. <laughs> like we were regularly going through like 15 to 20 foot waves, just nonstop for three days. Like we weren't even allowed to go outside, which as a smoker sucked well we we could we would have to go out to like where the bridge is and we have to like sign something saying like i'm going outside so that way they know like if they don't see you out there they're like oh shit he fell overboard yeah but that that's that, that, that shit sucked and then like as soon as we got home to like virginia we we're like oh my god it's calm it's beautiful we can go outside now and it's almost christmas it's it's always weird going from like south to north especially during the winter time when you're going that quickly but it's also not that quickly because it only takes a couple days to go from like Florida to Virginia or even Boston. It takes like three, four, or five maybe days. And during the winter, you know, it's still super hot in like the Caribbean and Florida. And then you get back home and it's like 30 degrees. And so all the people that, that didn't bring cold weather gear, now they're all freezing their asses off as we pull in. I always felt so bad, but I always had my hoodies, so I was okay. Yeah, our, our last patrol that I was on, we actually ended up borrowing a different boat from a different unit because our boat was being sent to basically dry dock, not actually dry dock. Oh, yeah, no, it was dry dock. They were, we were getting new generators put in. And so we just borrowed a different unit's boat and took that one underway. And of course, they had just gotten back from patrol when we took over. So they did like no maintenance at all. And so the entire time we were constantly trying to catch up on their maintenance and their work. And then like shit was constantly breaking because they didn't do the maintenance. Every every time we would do like a simple maintenance item, we'd pull it open. And it's like, oh, wow, if they had checked this in the last six months, they would have noticed this is fucked. <laughs> It was really bad. Down in main control, like the main engineering control center, there, there's an AC system and everything, but there's also a ton of electronics. And one of the pipes on the AC system burst and went spraying everywhere, all over our big control dashboard Ooh. and everything. And it almost got water on our massive switchboard that regulates all of the power for the ship. <laughs> so the coolant was like water-based and conductive then? Yeah, so it, it used like a circulating water system from the AC compressors to like the fans throughout the ship, basically. Oof. Yeah. And so when that pipe burst, it went spraying everywhere, it ruined a couple of the screens that we had. We had like three screens for like monitoring and controlling all of our equipment, ruined two of the screens, you know, it almost flooded the switchboard, which is taking energy directly, electricity, very high voltage electricity directly from two massive diesel generators and then converting that into usable power. And a friend of mine and I, we were just there vacuuming up water with a shop vac, standing in this water right next to the switchboard. We're like, oh my God, if this goes up like an inch, we're fucked. Thankfully, we stopped the, the water though. So didn't have to die that day. <laughs> yeah, but we ended up with like 
quite a few like casualties is what we call it, which is just like, it's not like per personnel, but more just casualties refers to anything going wrong, like anything breaking or whatever. So like, just, I don't know, like, uh, like, oh, like the story about like Honduras with us backing out and the engines going out, like that's a, that's a casualty. Um, but we were, we were all trained on how to respond to all that. You know, we would do drills all the time, like damage control drills. And part of that, like for any sort of like damage control stuff, like my job basically like in general was just be on like the firefighting team. So I'd get dressed up in the whole firefighting suit and the, with the air tank and everything. And we'd go and fight the fire and all that shit. And thankfully never any real fires. We had, we had a couple instances where we had like smoke coming out of motors and stuff. Thankfully those never escalated into like true fires. One of them I got to report. It was just like, we were just sitting um, in port, like in between patrols and I was on duty and they were like figuring out some electrical stuff. And then all of a sudden, like the hot water pump just started smoking out the ass, which that was fun. I just, we just shut down the power. It was fine. There was another one where I wasn't on watch, but someone else was while we were underway. And like the anchor windlass, like these big giant motors that basically pull the anchors out of the water. One of those caught fire for some reason. I don't remember why it was, I think it had something to do with like the wiring being exposed and some like water on it on or something. I don't know, but that caught on fire. The whole space was filled with smoke, which that was very scary because directly in front of the anchor windlasses is what we call the paint locker, which is where we carry like a ton of hazmat, like, um, like oil and paint and paint thinner and all this like alcohol, like all that sort of stuff. Um, so that was a scary one, but it never really escalated too much for some reason. Anytime we had like an alarm, like a casualty, it always happened in the middle of the night. It was never at a good time. It was always the middle of the night. We would get woken up like 12, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, like, oh, there's a fire alarm in such and such space. And oh no. So we'd all have to like jump out of bed, run to the repair lockers, get dressed up in our firefighting gear only to find out it was nothing. And it was awful. And that happened like at least once a patrol, there was always something. There was always something in the middle of the night that just happened randomly. Like one time it was something really, it was like a, a fuel leak. Like fuel was just spraying like crazy out of the uh, filter. Um, it was the fuel purifier actually. It was just spraying like crazy out of it all over the engine. And anytime that happens, it's immediately automatic general emergency. And it happened at like three in the morning. It was so annoying <laughs> and people always get freaked out because it's like, oh no, something could have happened. But the engineers don't get freaked out because we deal with that crap all the time. And so we're just very stupidly casual about it for no reason at all. <laughs> I remember, oh, um, one time we had again, middle of the night, general emergency, alarms blaring, announcements going off and all that. And at the time we had detainees on board and they were up on the O3 deck, which is the very top. It's outside. It's right next to where the mast is. And we always put up like a tent for them because we don't have holding cells. We just keep them on the roof basically with a tent and mats. And the guy on watch at the time, all like the alarms started going off and all the detainees are freaking out because they don't speak English. So they just hear alarms and someone talking. They're like, oh no, oh no. And so the detainee watch tender, he, he, he looked at me. He's like, hey, shh, 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 shh. And then he like basically motioned like it was a boat. He was like, <laughs> they all started freaking out. They're like, ah. <laughs> I was like, oh, you asshole. They don't have no idea what's going on. And you just told them the boat's sinking. <laughs> um, so I got another story. This is a, a mass man overboard story, basically. So this was, again, my first full patrol, that big East Pack. Um, we had stopped this big fishing boat. And it was, it was a pretty sizable one, probably like 100 feet or so. You know, pretty sizable ocean-going fishing boat. And obviously we had intel beforehand that they had something on board. So we boarded them and we were on that boat. Our, our, our boarding crew was on there for like almost 24 hours. So they, they boarded them like midday that day. And then the next morning, it's like 8 a.m. And we just suddenly hear man overboard, man overboard. Like someone piped it. And we all like kind of stood there for a second. Like, is that for real? Like, really? And then they just piped it a second, a second time. Like several people in the water, man overboard. And we're like, oh shit. We run out there. Turns out the whole thing and boat is just listing over and everyone's jumping off oh. so what had happened was in this big fishing boat in their little fishing holds there was a shitload of drugs which they estimated to be about somewhere between two to three thousand kilos of cocaine most likely allegedly we never got the drugs because they sank the damn thing so 
in these fish holds, they can control how much water is in them. And they have their own engineer, and we have a translator. And the translator was telling them, hey, empty these tanks, fill these tanks so that we can check what's in them and all that. And he was pretending like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. But we have a fucking translator who's fully fluent native speaker. He's like, you're an asshole. But so he continues to pretend like he has no idea what's going on and floods all the port side tanks on the left side and then empties all the right side, the starboard tanks. And as that happens, a big storm comes up. Uh Uh-oh. And wind starts blowing, the seas are getting heavy, and it just starts listing over and capsizes. Oh my God. And so all the people on board, which was like around 20 or 25 guys, they all had to jump off, including our boarding team they all had to jump off and we we saw the drugs in those fish holds by the way like we have a little like um a little like water drone like a rov that we sent down there with a camera we saw it down there and they had a little little red briefcase that we assume had money i don't know yeah so boat starts capsizing everyone jumps off all their fishing gear because they were like disguised pretty well they had fishing gear everywhere that all went in the water so our small boat that was trying to pick people up their motor got fouled up because it's a jet drive, so it sucks water up and shoots it out. All that fishing gear went up into there. Ruined that. As this is happening, the storm's continuing to build up more and more. It's like basically fucking raining sideways at that point. And so we're trying to pull people out of the water from the cutter, which it's not that maneuverable. And so the, the guys the guys driving, they did a great job in all honesty. You know, we put the nets over the side. We were throwing lines out to people, pulling them on board. At one point, I actually snagged a guy. And as I was pulling him towards the aft section where it's really low and you can pull people up, he went under what we call the migrant shitter, which is um, a hose that runs up to like a very makeshift porta potty where the detainees shit out of. And that hose goes into the ocean and I pulled him right under it oh and as i'm pulling him, he's like is that the shitter no and i'm like yes and um yeah so we got most basically everyone out of the water and at that point we we're kind of sitting there the the fish boat's like almost completely sideways and out of nowhere this random ass dude popped up out of, out of the boat someone who they had not seen the entire time that they were boarding this boat because as they were like investigating the boat they kept finding more and more people that originally were not supposed to be there and this dude had been hiding out for like almost 24 hours pops up looks around sees the boats like totally sideways and we're all on the boat like looking at him, like yelling at him like come on jump 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 and instead of jumping he does what any reasonable person does he strips down to his underwear his fucking tidy whities turns around and slides belly first down the side of the hull of the boat which we all just cringed at because boats get filled with barnacles and those motherfuckers are sharp i don't know how he didn't get cut but he didn't get cut (laughs) and we had a rescue swimmer in the water with him who was like yelling at him too and he he got him we pulled him on board i helped hold him up and after we got them both on board our doc came up and he was checking them out you know he checked out the swimmer he was like you good you feel good all right cool off but yeah that was our big mass man overboard um we all got like some sort of medal for it. I don't remember the name of it, but we all, like the whole crew, got something for it. And then the rescue swimmer, actually, he was a buddy of mine in my shop. He actually got to then fly out from that patrol back home, and he went to D.C. where they had the Coast Guard ball. He got to attend. Damn. (laughs) And so we just got to see a picture of him standing very awkwardly behind the vice commandant. Yeah, that was our big mass man overboard. And since all that stuff sunk away with the boat we had no evidence on them all those thousands of kilos gone all the money that they had gone all the evidence was gone but on the other hand it's kind of like a retribution to us that meant that we didn't have to treat them like detainees we could treat them like migrants but we could also lock them up and what that matters is is how you feed them because migrants or search and rescue survivors you have to give them rice and beans whereas detainees just eat what we eat so we got to feed these mother rice and beans because they just tried tried to kill us (laughs) It was a tiny little bit of retribution for us. I don't know. Yeah, that was one of the craziest things in all honesty. It was so hectic. Like I remember um, a couple of the guys were pulling people out of the water, pulling people because there's like a little Jacob's ladder from the, the back of the boat where people were coming up. And so a couple of guys were back there helping pull them back up on board. And right as they were doing it, like a big ass wave hit the boat and it like almost threw them off. And this one big dude who was in my shop, he was out there as well. He was just, he was just a big guy 
just in general. He grabbed two of these guys and the guy that they were holding onto and yanked them back up on board, all three of them at once. Whoa. Which was just insane to me because I don't know. There's like, they're all, each of them weighed at least 180 pounds mm-hmm. minimum. He, he kind of fucked up his back, but he did it. So that was an interesting day. <laughs> Not what we expected at all. But yeah, that was our masked man overboard. Oh, another one. This is totally unrelated. This one dude shot himself in the stomach for reasons that we assume was trying to get out of patrol. It was like right before patrol. And it was going to be, I think it was the last patrol that I did. And like the day before, the dude shot himself in the stomach, like in a Walmart parking lot. Oh my gosh. Just to get out of it, I guess. And he hadn't even been on a patrol yet. So I was like, you don't even know how bad it's going to be. Why are you doing this, man? I don't know. I don't know what kind of stuff he was going through, but like... At this, like he showed up the next day and we were like, what is your problem? Because you're kind of screwing yourself and you're screwing us because you're taking someone out of the watch rotation. So our lives are going to be harder now because you're not here. So thanks, I guess. But he shouldn't even have had a gun because he was too young to have one. He was like 19, which in Virginia, you have to be 21, I think. And plus where he shot himself was like right at the side of his stomach where like basically like where your love handle is. There's nothing to hit there. So we felt like it was very likely intentional. But at the same time, I don't know the whole story, so I don't know. I have I have one last funny story. Then after that, if you want, if you still want to keep going, I can go into like why the Coast Guard kind of sucks. Okay, here's the problem. I don't want you getting a fucking military yeah. guy on you and me have to take down another video and fuck <laughs> my channel again. <laughs> if if I go over it, I can definitely like keep it civil and not go too crazy. I'll just talk about general issues, not something specific okay. about that. So. When I was at the ant team, so we had like a little office area plus like a big garage space with like the boat and the truck and whatever. And a little office room there. We had like a little trash can and behind the trash can one day we just found a dead snake randomly, which was very weird because it's like in a closed building. It's not like some shack or whatever. It's It's a normal office building and there's just a dead snake chilling behind the trash can. So we decided to give it a whole ass funeral service that day because we were very bored (laughs) we went all out on this so in our little workshop my buddies and i we made a tombstone out of wood we put his name on there steven the snake question mark through 2022 (laughs) we stained it we like singed it a little bit to give it some age and everything we give get like put some stakes on it we brought him out to our little uh buoy yard we buried him and i had uh, bagpipes playing from my phone while we buried him <laughs> put him in the ground there oh my that's god that's steven the goddamn snake he's still there to this goddamn day that's amazing we never knew him but we loved him and honestly honestly we almost started tearing up when we were burying him with the music playing <laughs> honest to god never knew this snake but we started almost tearing up when we were burying him i don't know why i think we were just that bored it just happened <laughs> The human brain will find anything to entertain itself. Yeah, literally. Because at that unit, it was a lot more chill. We had a lot more free time. And at that time, like, I think our boat was doing some, like, serious maintenance. So we had literally nothing to do for, like, two or three weeks. So we found anything to do. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. I think that does it for my fun stuff on this list. I think I can get into the serious stuff. What is wrong with the Coast Guard? So there are a lot of issues with the Coast Guard, and I'm just speaking more generally because I don't want to be too mean. But in general, it feels like there's not enough funding all the time. The Coast Guard gets very little money compared to the other branches, and that is felt at all levels. From the top to the bottom, we all feel it all the time. We all have very limited budgets, barely have any money for anything. You know, thankfully, the the cooks have enough money to give us decent food, but like, ugh, it's bad. And there's always been this motto in the Coast Guard of doing less with more. And these days they are really stretching that motto because most of our stuff, it's incredibly old. Most of our like combat gear, like weapons, protective gear, most of that shit's hand-me-downs from the Navy. Like when I was on the cutter, one of my optional things to do was I was part of the misfire team for the big gun. And the flak helmets that we wore were from the Navy in the Gulf War. Oh. Yeah, it's bad. All the ammo there was surplus from the Navy back from like the 60s and 70s. That boat was well over 30 years old. While Meanwhile, the Navy's like decommissioning boats after 10. And that's not even the oldest of them. It's ridiculous. And it's not just that the Coast Guard 
doesn't have enough money. It's that they also spend it very poorly and irresponsibly. I saw a small amount of this because I was just a non-rate. I was very low down in the ranks, but I heard a lot about it from the guys up above me. There's just such a misallocation of funds and just so much being wasted all the time. And and that, that rings true for a lot of branches too. Like there's always money being wasted, you know, like half the food that we would make on the cutter just get thrown out afterwards because we're not going to keep it. We don't have anywhere to keep it. And what are we going to do with it? We're just going to throw it overboard. It's gone. All that food, gone. <laughs> like hundreds of dollars worth, just gone every day. I mean, yeah, that's just how the Coast Guard operates, I guess, you know? Like, even even like our helicopters are old. The helicopters that we would bring with us to do drug patrols, they are so old that they don't make them anymore, and they don't make new parts for them anymore. So instead of, like, getting someone to make parts, they just have a fleet of old ones that are just like a graveyard. And they just pull pieces off them when they need new parts. That's how bad it is. Oh, like the um, the transfer case gears for the 270s. So it's like the engine has its drive shaft that goes to the transfer case and has gears. And that goes to the propeller shaft. Make sure everything's spinning at the right speed. That company has been gone for a long time. They don't make them anymore. There are no replacement parts. So if one of those breaks, the ship gets decommissioned. Oh my gosh. That's it. Yeah. The propeller shafts. They don't make them anymore. There is a handful of them left. And if one of your propeller shafts is fucked up, eventually they're going to run out and they just have to start decommissioning cutters. That's such a blatant failure to even allocate your resources to maintaining your existing resources. What the hell? Yeah. And like they're they're trying to make new cutters. Like there's a new one coming out soon, hopefully, called the Arcus. It's going to be like a 360 foot cutter that's called an OPC. It was supposed to be released and like um, commissioned back in, I think, 2021. We ain't got a boat yet. <laughs> um, one of the guys who used to be on the on the cutter I was on, he actually got transferred to that boat while it's still being made. And so since it's not ready and since he can't start training on it, he's just been hopping around doing temporary deployments and temporary stations at different units all over the country because there's just no boat. And also it's it's been heavily delayed because the Coast Guard just for some reason wasn't paying the contractors that make the boat. So they all just walked off. <laughs> Same thing happened with a lot of our uh, our big like buoy tenders, the big black hulls. They had to like go through like a big, basically like a service life extension program where they just go into dry dock, do a bunch of work on them. Same thing with those guys. They weren't getting paid, so they just walked off. Now all these boats that were being used are just sitting there. Like you can't even blame the people that ended up walking off because like they're not getting paid. What are they supposed to do? Yeah, they're they're contractors that are supposed to be paid by the government, but someone in the Coast Guard fucked it up, and so they didn't get paid. I don't know what exactly went wrong there, but for whatever reason, they weren't getting their money. So no boat for us. And this shiny new beautiful boat that we're supposed to be getting is being indefinitely delayed. Who knows when it's going to be coming? And then there's also, this is shifting gears a bit. There's also the issue of recruiting slash retention. This kind of rings true for the other branches as well, from what I've heard. Um, I don't have any experience with them, but from what I've heard online, it's the same thing in the Coast Guard where the retention rate is plummeting. People are not staying in. Everyone's getting out. Everyone's leaving the services. Because people realize that, sure, yeah, they can do this job here in the Coast Guard, but if they get out and do it as in the civilian sector, they can be making two, three, four, five times the amount of money. And then they don't have to move every three years. They have a much better quality of life. They won't get reprimanded and seriously f***ed up, like, legally, I guess, if they talk bad to someone above them, that sort of stuff. You know, people, they, they just see that there's no reason, there's no incentive for them to stay in these days. And the Coast Guard and I guess the military as a whole is just not giving it to them. And then there's, related to that, there's a big disconnect between the workforce and the high command. Everyone is saying, it's a retention problem. You're not treating your people correctly. It's sucking here. Everyone hates it. It's better on the outside if they get out and use the same skills that they have. Whereas... The high command just wants to keep saying, it's a recruiting problem. We're not recruiting enough people. We got to up the recruiting thing. Like, that's not going to help. Because if you fix the recru the retention problem, you also fix the recruiting problem. Because if people see that people want to stay in, and they start spreading that word around, they want to stay in, it's a great deal, then that's going to make more people want to sign up. Because nowadays, you know, people that are thinking of signing up, they go to talk to people that are in or have been in recently. And the people that are in or have been in, most of the time, tell them, don't and do it. Just don't. Because it's not worth it for most people. You know, I, I did it because I didn't really have many options at the time. But a lot of people, if you have options, I, would, I wouldn't 
do it. It's just not worth it. You know, so many people end up with so many issues. You know, the, the work that you do in the military is so hard on your body and your mind, depending on what you're doing, that it really can fuck you up for life. You know, mechanics like what I was doing, if I had kept doing that for more, for longer, I, I would be so up like my back would be gone you know even just the small amount of time i spent doing that i i still feel it you know i feel it in my back if, if i move the wrong way my back will be screwed up i'll get a spasm i'm done for a week <laughs> i'm gone you know and like while, while i was on the, the cutter like doing all that mechanical work you know you're in these tight spaces with all these pipes and shit you, you move the wrong way once you just knock your head and i lost count of how many times i've knocked my head i got to the point where it didn't even hurt when i knocked my head i don't know what kind of problems that might have made for me i don't know <laughs> it sure isn't isn't on my va claim because they didn't find it hearing loss i've definitely got that my hearing's awful now but according to like coast guard and va it's not bad enough that i get disability pay you know because you know you go into an engine room down there you have to have hearing protection on if you don't have it on you're like deafened for a few minutes it's awful but yeah there's just there's just very very little incentive for people to stay in you know like the whole argument of oh but you're serving your country it's good for the country all that stuff isn't that feel great like that's that argument's really failing these days the idea of service to your country just it's nowhere near as appealing as it used to be and I mean, I don't blame people for not wanting to do it. <laughs> like, I appreciate what I got out of it, but I think if I hadn't gotten, like, the GI Bill or something like that, it would have been a total waste of my time. There was nowhere for me to go there. Um, I'm colorblind, so, like, the options were severely limited for me as well. And so, without that, without the GI Bill paying for my college, it would have been a complete waste of my time. It would have been a total regret. You know, I still have a lot of regrets about it. I wish I had done so many other things, but... <laughs> It just was awful. You know, it was awful for my mental health while I was on that boat, you know. Like there there were there were times in all honesty when I would I would be sitting there in the middle of a patrol in my in my shop, like at night or something, and I, I look and see like the extension cords and wonder like, oh, I think if one wonder if that one would hold my weight. And people think about that all the time, you know, and it, it doesn't and they say they're trying to take it seriously with like depression and shit, but they don't. They really don't take it seriously enough. You know, like I remember one guy on the boat, he straight up he came to his chiefs, you know, the, the people who were supposed to be there for the enlisted to help them. He told them, I think I'm depressed. I'm, I am having issues at home. He was having some issues at home as well and all this crazy stuff. And they just told him to stop being sad. Like, uh, really? He's, he's doing a lot better now, thankfully. But no thanks to them, he's doing better. Like, it's just ridiculous. Like, sure, yeah, you get free health care in the military, but it ain't great. <laughs> You're not getting good free health care. It's just free but even then sometimes they might take it out of your paycheck depending on what it is i've heard a lot of horror stories <laughs> of people trying to go through medical to do things it's really bad it's just kind of ridiculous you know i i could easily rant for even longer i'm trying to look at my <laughs> my little list here oh my god I, I haven't even mentioned covid good lord yeah covid was awful during when i was on on the uh the cutter because we still had to do our patrols you know so for the two weeks before the patrol, you'd have to quarantine, basically, because they want to make sure everyone getting on board for that patrol is going to be safe. Fine. You get on board. The first week, you have to wear a mask 24-7. Okay. Sucks. Whatever. Then, like, port calls. Can't have them. Best we can do is you can sit on the pier and not doing anything, which is awful, because you're stuck underway for two months at a time, and you barely get a break whatsoever. Like, that seriously weighs, wears people down so fast. And even for my boat, it was bad, but there were other boats like the high endurance cutters, um, the newer ones, um, the 418 foot cutters, they would be underway for 45 days at a time, no break, no nothing. Just no break, nonstop, 45 days, constantly working. You don't get a break. You don't get to go to shore, nothing. Like, because when COVID started, one of the higher ups at Commandant or something asked down to the higher up officers in charge of all the cutting, their cutter force. And asked them, how long can our cutters stay away, uh, underway? And those captains told them 45 days, because 45 days is the maximum amount of time that they're allowed to stay underway. Like, maximum. They have to pull in after that amount of time. They were like, yeah, we can do 45 days all the time now. So it went from like very normal, balanced work schedules to just you you're screwed like <laughs> wow so when people are treated like that they don't want to stay in that's what i gotta say <laughs>
don't don't get me wrong there are benefits and you'll you'll always hear people saying like oh well i had a great time in the military it's like okay well you were lucky pretty much i think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that how well you enjoy the military is based a lot on how well you do and how well you work but they forget that a massive amount of that is just luck it's just luck on if you get sent to a good unit or you get sent to a shit unit. It's literally luck of the draw. You don't get to have the final say on where you end up living. You don't get to say, oh, I want to stay in this area for a while and it, it happens. You can suggest that. doesn't mean it'll happen. You, you might get bounced around the country every three years. I, I knew a couple guys who had to do that. They wanted to stay on the East Coast their whole career. And they kept getting bounced around East Coast, West Coast every single time they they uh, transferred like that will impact your mental health no matter who you are to not have a home base like that yeah wow imagine that but then you also have a spouse children and like your your normal time at a station is at, at any duty station is three to four years but let's say you're there for a year and you get promoted you make the next rank congrats well wow, it's amazing but now they have to move you you don't get to stay there now they need you somewhere else because now you're this new fancy rank. The, the, the amount of mental toll that puts on someone is just insane. Moving that much. It's just no, nobody wants to do that. Nobody does. The only people that are really even remotely fine with that are people that are single. They don't have any attachments or anything. No. The moment you have a family, it's awful. I survived it because I didn't have anyone to move with. It still sucked because, I mean, I, I was doing long distance with my girlfriend for four years. Spent the first year up in Boston, and I'd only see her once every few months. Get underway for two to three months. You're back in port for two to three months. I might go home for a week then. And then it's like another five months till I see her again. It's like, oh, this is great. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, after I was in Boston for a year um, on that cutter, we did a home port shift to Virginia, which is much closer to home. I was able to like finally drive home for the weekends, but that was it. Like, still sucked. But even then, still gone for months at a time. Well, considering all of your experiences, both positive and negative, what would you say the Coast Guard has taught you most? I think it definitely it taught me a good work ethic for sure. Before I joined, I was lazy shithead teenager. Now I can work my ass off. You know, I I learned a lot about how to like really push myself. You know, it, it joined the Coast Guard and I think a lot of people from the military in general, it, it, it teaches you how far you're able to push yourself, you know, because like on the cutter, sometimes we'd have 24 to 48 hour days where it's just, you don't get to sleep because there's things to do. Boot camp teaches you how much, how far you can push your body. And then being on the cutter showed me how far I could really push my mind to just go through it. I think that was the biggest, most significant takeaway for me the coast guard and the military it has its great benefits it can really improve you but you got to be lucky and you got to make the most of it and for right now i don't think there's enough incentives for most people to join that's like kind of the gist of what i was trying to get at earlier yeah for sure well regardless of the current and future prospects for those joining i would like to say thank you very much for the time you spent there keeping the people of our country safe and i'm sure many others will also be very thankful thank you very much i definitely definitely had my fun there there i had a lot of really great memories from the coast guard you know a lot of fun mixed in with the bad and i try to remind myself of those bad things because you tend to shut them out and remember all the good and i try to remind myself it wasn't that great i had my fun i had a lot of great friends i, I made some of the best friends of my life some of the closest people I've ever been with. And I, I, I love that. I, I love those great memories. But I never let myself forget how much I hated it all the time. For sure. Well, thank you very much for your service. And I hope this isn't the last time we talk in the near future because I really hope to spend more time with you in virtual reality. It seems like you've had a good time here today. Yeah, same here. I would, I would love to come back. Tell me a story. Tell me a story, I want to hear it You might think it's boring, but I'm interested